Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the Can Atlantic Conference, the, Mid the country's first Mid Atlantic Cannabis Conference, brought to you by the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists. If you're watching this current session, this session is sponsored by Cresco Labs, a multi state operator that has several cannabis dispensaries and grower processors across the country, including some in the Mid Atlantic region. Today's QA is with Michael Self, Vice President of Cresco Labs Social Equity and Educational Department program, also known as the SEED program. Michael, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate having you on here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? Um, we're going to go right into the uh, questions. So um, before Cresco, let's give people some background historical information about who you are and, and, and what you what you used to do and you know how that mm -hmm. carries with you in this current uh, position that you find yourself in. So before Cresco Labs, you worked as a behavioral counselor a mental health professional and a crisis worker. Um, you also worked with LGBT youth in the juvenile justice system. Um, tell us a little bit more about the those experiences. What did you learn? And did any of those experience actually any of those experiences actually touch cannabis or actually involve any sort of information around cannabis? These are excellent questions. Um, so I it's rare that I get to talk about, you know, where I'm from and what my what my professional background is. But I think um, all of those experiences prepared me for where I am right now today at Cresco Labs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think what I learned, um, the biggest thing I learned from all of those experiences is that we are all one crisis, one sickness, one mistake, you know, um, one bad decision away from being someone who is um, in a position of a service provider versus being the person that is be, uh, the, the person that's being served. So um, I think what I take away from that is just being very grateful um, and being very humble and knowing that at any moment, you know, it could have been me. It could be me in those positions. So I always want to be able to um, work with people from the perspective of, you know, what if that were me? What if that were my child? What if that were somebody in my family that I cared about? Um, and so, yeah, I just, I feel like my career has centered around working with vulnerable populations and um, I absolutely love it. I consider myself a social justice nerd, um, you know, taking in as much information and learning, you know, as I go. Uh, you know, I haven't always been, you know, knowledgeable about different social justice issues. And I, and, I, and there are still some that I'm, um, you know, that I don't know about. So I'm always interested in learning more and learning more about people and the human condition and, you know, giving people grace and, and being flexible um, about uh, a person's perspective and also being very respectful of that. Um, I think uh, the next part of the question, did any of my experience involve the impacts of cannabis and drug prohibition? I mean, you know, working in the areas of juvenile justice and, and criminal justice and homelessness and uh, public health with people living with uh, mental health diagnoses, um, how could it not? You know, I think what I think of uh, that most closely aligns with that is watching kids sit in court and be given five years probation. And in those five years, this youth is supposed to be perfect. They're not supposed to skip school. They're not supposed to use cannabis or any type of drugs. Um, they're not supposed to be out past curfew. You know, all of those different things. And it's like, I don't, I'm a, I'm a grown up. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could not do any of those things in the next five years. And so what we, what, what I saw a lot was kids being violated because they were caught consuming cannabis. Um, and so I, I, I feel like that is not uh, a fair uh, position to be in. That's not justice as, as I would have it to be. Thank you for that. I feel like that's important for people to know, you know, where you come, where do you come from? And, and that's something that I always like to ask people before they got into the cannabis industry specifically, you know, what brought them into this space. So thank you for a little bit of background on that. Um, we're going to move a little bit in the timeline of your, of your career um, right before you got to Cresco labs. Um, we're going to dovetail into this, but um, you know, you also worked as an independent justice uh, uh, consultant and you also worked for Deloitte as well. Um, so a lot of consulting 
uh, background and experience. Yes. <laughs> you know, given that background in consulting, um, what what lured you away from those jobs, and what brought you to Cresco Labs specifically? What made you say this is the company that I want to work for? Ooh, good question. Um, I think Cresco for me offered the position that I had been looking for um, my entire career. I was looking for the opportunity to make ch make changes and make a difference and you know in a very hands-on way. I think in being a consultant and in working in criminal and juvenile justice and working in public health and and in homelessness, you make you make that change but you don't always necessarily see those changes or it feels like even though you are making those changes on a daily basis the system um, in which you work is so large, it's hard to, to feel like you're doing anything. It's hard to feel like you're making, um, you know, you're making a positive impact. So I think the, this position, um, when I saw the, the posting for this position, I remember um, I was like, wow, it sounds like this job was written for me. Um, and so I sent it to one of my friends who is an executive in human resources. I'm like, okay, for real, just tell me, is this, you know, am I qualified to do this? Does this seem like this, you know, it would be a good job fit for me? Um, and she was like, yes, absolutely. You're qualified this, you know, based on your experience, based on your interests, go for it. And so I really see um, the role of Cresco as an opportunity to have a direct positive impact on systemic racism. Um, and most specifically, uh, the disproportionate war on drugs, it, the disproportionate impact of the war on drugs. Um, in terms of the program itself, can you give people, you know, a comprehensive understanding of what the SEED program is? I mean, how was it pitched to you and how would you describe it to people? Yeah, so um, the way the SEED program was pitched to me is... Um, Exactly. Just working on behalf of uh, people and communities that have been impacted, negatively impacted by the war on drugs. Um, and so just to give an overview of SEED, SEED is social equity and educational development. Our mission is to develop and um, facilitate tangible pathways for people businesses and communities that have been negatively impacted by the war on drugs. And we do that through our three pillars. And our three pillars are social justice, the community business incubator, and um, education and workforce development. And so social justice is about expungement and criminal justice reform. Um, the community business incubator is about helping people um, that will qualify as social equity applicants uh, by their state guidelines, um, uh, apply for a cannabis license, and then go from license to operation. Um, so providing technical assistance, writing assistance, um, mentorship, uh, access, and facilitating um, access to certain networks to raise capital for your business. Um, you know, giving you that, that information on that giving you the information that um, is different about the cannabis industry. So you may already be a business owner, but you're entering a highly regulated industry. What specific information do you need to be able to write an application and to be able to open a business and, and, and how, does it, how can that business thrive? Um, so, so that's the community business incubator. And I think when people hear about seed, um, mostly they think the community business incubator because that's what's in the news. That's that's kind of the, the most exciting, you know, thing. This is the exciting opportunity um, within the cannabis industry right now. Um, so people all the time uh, will contact me and say, I want to get involved in seed. And I always, you know, I'll always smile. I'm like, I think you mean the, the community business incubator. Um, but our, our third pillar is education and workforce development. And what the work we're doing um, there is um, really working with community colleges and universities to write and expand cannabis curricula. Um, again, providing that technical expertise, um, you know, pro uh, providing uh, guest lectures, teaching whole classes, um, connecting folks from these programs 
two uh, potential open positions at Cresco. We're working on developing an internship program right now. Um, there are quite a few things that we are in conversation and in the planning stages of doing that we're really excited, you know, for COVID-19 to go away, for 2021 to get here, to really see, you know, how we can implement um, our programs um, and impact people uh, for the, the long term. And I appreciate you clarifying too, because um, it does seem like some parts of the seed program are definitely, uh, uh, you know, marketed or at least promoted. So I appreciate you breaking it down um, for a little bit more understanding of the program itself. Um, who, who would you say, I guess, you know, is are the target audiences that you hope to um, attract for for this program? Who are you looking for or, or hoping, you know, comes your way? It's a great question. So. At a high level, it's people who qualify as social equity applicants. So if we're talking about the community business incubator specifically, if you can uh, qualify based on the state qualifications or the state guidelines as a social equity applicant, then you would be eligible to be considered um, to enter our community business incubator. Um, and then also, you know, I can say, our target population are people that have been negatively impacted by the war on drugs. But what does that really mean for real, for real? <laughs> that really means black and brown people um, because you know that's what the data bears out. For you, how are you, how are you measuring the success of your effort? You mentioned you know, sometimes you can't see the direct impact of your previous work. Sometimes it was kind of hard to, to understand really how much of a difference you were making in people's lives. Um, in your current position, um, given the nature and really the, the scope of this project, um, how are you measuring the success of this project? And like, what are your, what are the goals that you have? Great question. So I think it is, it is a big program. It is a, a big endeavor to take on. And I think while we are in our infancy, we're trying to take small bites um, because we're building and doing at the same time. And we've had lots of conversations on how do we measure impact? What it, what impact, what outcomes are we looking for? You know, what is our vision and how are we going to live in our vision as we're designing um, and executing programs? So I would say our, our, in the short term, our goals are how can we reach as many people as possible for certain things? Like, so for expungement, you know, how can we reach as many people as possible to um, pay for their rap sheet so they can have access to their criminal record to determine if they um, if they are eligible for having their record expunged. So the more people we can uh, touch with that, the better. Um, same thing with education. You know, how many schools can we work with? You know, what is our capacity? Are there 30 students in the class? You know, are there 100 uh, students that are enrolled in the certificate program? So those are some of the things that we're, you know, that we're trying to do right now. We're trying to scale um, our, our programs. But I think down the line, um, we can do so much more than that. You know, um, we want to know how this person who got their record expunged, um, like how their lives have been changed as a result of that or this person who's gone through our community business incubator and was able to um, uh, be awarded a cannabis license, how has um, thriving in the cannabis industry impacted that person um, as an individual? How has it impacted their family? How has it impacted their community? Um, but I think those metrics, it's going to take some time to, uh, to gather the data for those metrics. Um, even you know, right now in the in the middle of you know a pandemic and dealing with COVID nineteen and all the delays that that have caused, that has caused. You know, the courts have been closed, so our expungement data or the ex the expungement outcomes that we would want to be able to gather in six months, a year, eighteen months. That you know, all of that is now pushed back. So right now we are in the in the in the in the throes of building and you know scaling up our programming but in the long term we want to be able to say this is how we've positively impacted people's lives this is how communities have been changed by our investment and our support given your background you mentioned that you are a 
social justice nerd, so to speak. Um, you know, given given your corporate background, now that you, you wear a corporate hat, and um, Presco Labs is involved in you know trying to get more uh, licenses and growing its footprint, and you know really being a multi-state operator. Um, do you feel like your position, being in your corporate position, has that hindered or impacted your uh, ability to advocate for criminal justice reform? Um, have you are you able to still be a vocal advocate for that as well? Um, or do you kind of have to navigate some of that space uh, because you work for a cannabis company? Um, let me think about that for a second. I think, you know, there are realities, right? I can't go out and, you know, put out something on Instagram that would make Cresco look horrible, you know? Um, so I think that that is that is a reality. And I mean, I think I would say I don't, I don't have anything that I would say to make Cresco look horrible, but I do think that there are some some boundaries to being an employee in a in a corporate space as opposed to being an independent consultant. Um, uh, as I as I in my previous um, professional life, um, I do think that Cresco is is dedicated to criminal justice reform. Um, I think that our approach to criminal justice reform um, is really about the relationships that we have with, you know, in the political space and the opportunity and, and the, I would say the space that we take up um, as a corporation, um, it gives us a voice. We, we have that privilege to have a voice. So how do we use that voice in a way that um, is responsible and beneficial to our target population and to the masses with respect to the unjust war on drugs or criminal criminal um, justice reform at large. Um, and I would say just in general, when we're talking about criminal justice reform, we have to, you know, really redefine public safety. You know, when we're talking about, um, you know, thinking about people that have been impacted by the war on drugs, why were they impacted by the war on drugs? Um, you know, where are they now and how are they regarded in our society? And are we any safer for how they were treated and what happened to them? Um, are their lives any better? Um, and I think that Cresco is behind me 100 percent on that philosophy and and that outlook on criminal justice reform. Um, global pandemic, but uh, a national uprising against police. Say it again. Start again. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You just went out for just a quick sec. Oh, gotcha. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with a global pandemic, and we're going to be in a pandemic for quite some time. And then on top of that, we're dealing with the national uprising to abolish police and really um, deconstruct and destroy um, and reimagine uh, what public safety looks like. Um, how have these two big events that are going to be going on for a while, how have the uprisings and the pandemic impacted your work and impacted your role uh, at Cresco Labs? So I think the pandemic in general impacted the way that we work. Um, our historically, and when I say historically, I mean in the last year, so not a huge amount of time, but I, I mentioned that we're trying to work with and serve as many people as possible. Well, in a pandemic, that's that's not going to work in person. You know, we would rent spaces so we can, you know, provide education to two, three hundred people um, at a time if we can, if we could. Um, and that's no longer possible. So how do we execute our programming in a virtual space? Or if we're doing expungement and we're paying for people to get fingerprinted for um, to get access to their to their rap sheet. Well, they have to show up to do that. So how do we do that in a way that's safe? And so what that means is things take a little longer. We have to have much smaller um, groups that we're serving. So we have to do programs more often to make sure we can have social distancing um, and all of those guidelines to make sure we're abiding by those, those public health guidelines. So that's how the pandemic has impacted our work, um, I guess I would say logistically. But I think the pandemic from a perspective of justice 
um, and um, the recent uprisings. Um, I think it has made, for me personally, it has made what we're doing in, uh, in the SEED initiative that much more real. Um, it was certainly real before. It was certainly um, a very serious uh, racial justice and, and working uh, to dismantle systemic racism is a very serious thing. But I think I'm used to working with vulnerable populations. I'm used to working in systems that are unjust and working to dismantle that. But I think what has happened in the last four to five months and, and certainly with the pandemic has made it, it it's, it's personal. This impacts me. Um, I've personally been impacted by COVID-19. So, um, and then when you think of the uprisings, I feel like George Floyd is my husband. Breonna Taylor is me. Breonna Taylor is my daughter. Um, so therefore the target population of seed is me. Um, and I am them, you know, so therefore I want, I want to succeed. Um, and I meaning us, you know, them, you know, I want all of us to succeed. And so I think what I've had time to think about is that um, working in a space that's centered on racial justice is very, very personal. And so trying to reconcile how the personal impacts uh, the professional um, has been, I think it's been a unique, it's been unique for me um, in these last couple months. But um, yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about it at um, at the office and at the office, I mean, on Zoom at the office or Microsoft Teams. Um, but we spent a lot of time talking about uh, the this health disparities with respect to COVID-19 and what role do we play um, to recognize those health disparities and to make a positive impact on people who are impacted by COVID-19. So, for example, the way the way seed looks at would look at that is okay there there are is a lot of attention for our first responders our nurses our doctors you know people uh police officers uh fire firefighters etc but what about people who aren't readily thought of as a first responder people who work in grocery stores people who drive buses um you know, all of those different careers where you don't get to stay at home and work from a computer screen, you have to show up and you have to show up to keep the, the world, the country running, you know, to keep us eating, you know. Um, and so how can we be of service to them? What about the communities where um, that that are hardest hit by COVID-19? How do we get into those communities and provide um, the, that kind of support um, with respect to the uprisings? What can we do? from a criminal justice perspective, who can we partner with? What gaps can we fill to make sure that um, the people who are who were arrested, um, do they know that even though they were arrested, but they, they weren't um, detained, that this is something that can still come up on their criminal record? Um, how do we educate them about that? How do we make sure that they get services to have their record expunged? So that that's, that's kind of what, you know, the things that we're talking about, the things that we're trying to implement, um, that's our the, the lens with which we view the uprisings and the pandemic. And I'm glad that you brought up the, uh, the idea of yeah, yeah, yeah. things that you guys are talking about to respond. Has Crescent Labs made or done any sort of initial response to the pandemic or the uprisings? What have what have been the kind of uh, programs or initiatives that y'all have rolled out in response to these? Uh, to yeah, them? good question. So. Um, we looked at, again, so those communities that, you know, would be hardest hit, you know, uh, with respect to health disparities and may not have access to PPE. So we um, reached out to those communities, um, the Cabrini Green community, um, uh, Howard Brown Health Center um, serves the Inglewood community here in Chicago. Um, and I, the, the name of the other organization is escaping me. We contacted them and said, how can we help? And I think that's another distinction with respect to the community engagement and the work that we do. We don't go into a community or we don't approach a community organization like this. We want to help and this is how we're going to help. We, we approach them. We would like to help. We'd like to learn about what it is that you do, what it is that you see are the biggest problems, where are your gaps and how can Cresco be of support 
in filling those gaps. So you lead us as the community organization. And so that's what we did. Um, and basically their biggest things were, we need to be able to provide PPE to people who don't have access for it, or may not understand that they need to have masks and gloves and hand sanitizer. Um, so if they asked for donations, we provided those donations. Some of the other things they asked for were donations for food boxes, um, things like that. With respect to the uprisings, we did the same thing. Um, we're working with, um, Cabrini Green Legal Aid here in Chicago to um, to pay for those rap sheets, to pay for a segment of those rap sheets. So Cabrini Green Legal Aid has other partners that they work with, like uh, legal groups that they work with um, that are working to defend people that are impacted uh, by uh, participation in protests and uprisings. So we want to be able to provide that support by paying for their rap sheet. So they don't have to go into the Chicago Police Department to get their rap sheet. Um, I would be oh, yes. to yeah. note that yeah. there are very few yeah. black people. Yeah. There are very few yeah. black people in VP corporate positions. What does it mean for you to really occupy really? a position in a space that very few of us can get to, or? occupy currently in this industry what does it mean to you again this is this goes back to with to when the personal you know um clashes not clashes but collides with the professional um i think what that means to me is taking the opportunity to explain my perspective and when i say my i mean our perspective um this is why, um, uh, you know, the latest news about Breonna Taylor is so painful. Um, this is why um, we want to go to community organizations and ask how can we be of service rather than um, telling them how we want to serve. Um, you know, explaining that nuanced approach and the purpose of it. We don't want to come from, uh, we don't want to be a part of the nonprofit industrial complex where, you know, you have to work with us because you need the money. So you don't really want to be bothered, but you're not going to turn down a donation either, you know? So we want to be welcomed into those spaces. And so I think because as you mentioned, Cresco is a, is a, it's a corporation. It's a, it's a big company. Um, not everyone comes from the community background that I have or the social justice passion that I have. So, or are black, you know? <laughs> um, so explaining that perspective and why it is important to um, consider that perspective, I think is, is where I fit into that space. I like to think that. Is in a future like Massachusetts, trying to implement social equity, trying to do economic empowerment, trying to experiment on incubators. What are the frustrations that you hear from people who qualify for social equity um, within applications for like the um, What are the frustrations you hear from? From cannabis entrepreneurs, and what should cannabis entrepreneurs know? Kind of like a, you know, make sure you have this, this, and this ready as legalization conversations happen. How should we prepare uh, for legalization um, based off of the frustrations that you hear and you deal with from other cannabis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, I think with respect to the incubator and the social equity applicants that we're working with right now, I think we're all learning together, to be honest. Um, and I think one of the things that I realized really quickly um, in, in the work of, of social equity and, and applying for licensure and running a community business incubator is you don't want to um, give false hope. I think false hope is worse than not doing anything at all, you know? Um, and so how do we do that? How do we not give false hope? And I think that is through education um, and making sure people do have the knowledge and have a realistic perspective of what it would mean to apply, to get a license and to be operational. 
I think some of the frustrations are um, it's this is a highly regulated industry. Um, it is an industry in which, you know, those regulations are expensive. Um, and if they're not expensive or even if uh, finances or economics is not a barrier for you, knowledge base may be a barrier for you. Um, so I think those are some of the frustrations um, from the perspective considering the perspective of a social equity applicant or, or somebody that is that has been comes from a community or has been personally um, negatively impacted by the war on drugs, they may not have the access to a network to raise capital. Um, they may not have the knowledge base, but they see this as an opportunity, you know? So how do you level set without killing someone's dreams, you know? Um, and make sure that you do provide the education. I have people, you know, that I've had people stop me at my daughter's dance class. I have had friends of friends hit me up in DMs asking about, you know, how can they get involved in the cannabis industry? And, you know, the first things I say is you need to educate yourself. And before, you know, COVID-19, one of the things I told a woman was, okay, you said you want to make baked goods. That was, you know, the message that she sent me. I want to make baked goods. What exactly does that mean? Do you want to make cakes? Do you want to make cookies? Do you want to make pies? And what do you know about extracting oil from a plant and then infusing that oil into your food product? What do you know about dosing and micro dosing? You know, all of those things, you know, you, you say you want to be a part of this and you're really excited about it, but you really also need to know what you're doing, you know? Um, so what I told her, I said, sis, Go to California, go to Colorado, learn your craft, learn how people are doing this so that then you can write a business plan with knowledge. You know, you're armed with the knowledge that says, I want to do this. I know about this. I know my path forward. And now all I need is the opportunity. Um, so those are the things that, you know, I would say are, are the biggest things I tell people. Educate yourself. And I think we bear the responsibility in making sure that people understand what highly regulated means with respect to the cannabis industry and what you're getting yourself into. Because as monumental of a task as writing an application is, that's the easy part. You know, once you get your license, how are you going to get operational? How are you going to stay operational? Um, you know, if you, you know, don't understand what those regulations are and, you know, God forbid, get a fine that could wipe out your whole small business. Um, so, yeah, I think our responsibility is making sure people really know what this industry is about and, and that they're armed with the tools and resources to succeed. Michael, it's been a great time talking to you. I really appreciate you giving us some more background about these two program. Is there um, any kind of information that you'd like to know so that they can get in touch with you or someone at Festival Labs to learn more about the seed program? Did you say give give my contact information? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. For whatever reason, I, I heard like every other word. <laughs> okay. So um, you can reach me um, at michael.self at crescolabs.com. My name is M-Y-K-E-L dot S as in Sam, E-L, P is in Paul, H at crescolabs.com. Email is by far the best way um, to get in contact with me. Um, yeah, and I look forward to talking to people. I, I love, this is Again, this is personal and professional for me. So I, I love, I'm loving what I do. I feel like this is my dream job and I want all of us to succeed. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.